All right, I want to greet you all this morning in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. Lord, we just ask that you would help us, Father, to pursue those things. Fill us with your spirit. Give us wisdom as we open your word. Help us have ears to hear and eyes to see. Again, we thank you for all that you do for us. Help us to be faithful again. Give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. I just want to use one verse here. It's verse 2. I want to start this with today. The verse says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what I want to talk about this morning is what repent actually means. It's a word we hear tossed about by religious people quite often. And I don't think anybody really knows what it means. Very few people. Most religious people don't. It's a really handy fill-in whenever there, there's nothing else to say. And maybe they want some different results, but you hear it a lot. One time uh, I was talking with a man, and he told me to repent. And... Uh, I said, well, what do I need to repent of? Or what is it? What is repent? And he said, well, you just need to repent. And that's about as far as it could go. Didn't really have a clue of what it meant or what, what, it, uh, what it was. But to understand repent, we need to understand what God wants from us. It says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. This verse. When we think of the word repent, we think, stop doing something that we're doing wrong. And that is not what repent means. Now we may, it may imply a little bit of that, but that's not the heart of repentance. Repentance is just not quit doing something that you're doing wrong. If you, get, if you start doing something, you get your hand slapped, you might not try to do it again because you know you're going to get your hand slapped again. You haven't repented. You've just stopped doing an action. That's all you've done. And you may never do that again, but you may have never repented of it either. Repentance produces that. Repentance produces a repairing of things. When the Pharisees came to John here and they said they wanted to be baptized and John said, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. I think that's one thing other, else that's, that's lacking. You know, a lot of times we'll apologize when we've done something wrong. And that helps us feel better but we haven't really repaired anything that we've done wrong. When we've truly uh, want to reconcile or we want to fix something, we go back and patch up what we did wrong. Whenever I was first converted, I, one of the things that I wanted to do, the first, whenever I first started trying to follow the Lord after I had repented, one of the first things I wanted to do was go back to everyone that I had done something wrong to and try to make that right, try to repair that problem if there was a possibility of doing that. Some didn't care. Some of them were glad. Well, I'm glad you said something about that because it really had made a difference. And just to go back and try to fix what we've done wrong. If you've stole something, go fix it. If you've lied, Go back and just fix it. Repair it. Don't just go say, I'm sorry, so I can feel better about it. Go back and actually fix something that you've done wrong. 
That's what true repentance brings. True repentance brings us back to where we're supposed to be with God. Brian brought out this morning about, he asked, the two of the two creations that God had made that had fallen away from God. What the boys mentioned Adam and Eve or humanity and then also Satan. And when we think about that, fallen from God, we think about the creation. Just learned some things this week, just a little bit more. I mean, I think we believed this all along, but just some, some of the deeper Hebrew words was brought to my attention that whenever God created in, in, the, in Genesis and it says, and it was good. You know, we think of good as ice cream. That's good. And, but that's not what it means. When, when God said something was good, it meant it was complete the way he wanted it to be. It was everything it needed to be. It was complete. It was just exactly what he wanted. And whenever he created man, he made man just exactly how he wanted him to be made. He made him with a will. He made him however he made him. He may have had blemishes as we think of blemishes, but he was complete and it was good the way God made him. It, everyone was different. Some were uh, man. We're all different in our, in our physical appearances. But in general, in the whole, it was good because it was what God wanted and they were fulfilling the purpose that God wanted them to fill, to walk with Him, to be in submission to Him, to be in His will. That's why the temptation of Jesus about His will was, is so important and often so neglected. Being complete was surrendered to God's will. Just that simple. And whenever he was surrendered to his will, he was complete. I think that's what he meant whenever he said it's finished. It's completed. I've completed what the will of God. I've finished my life in God's will. And that's what God wants for us. We often think so much that it's about our performance. But our performance is just a fruit of what we are. To be complete is to be what God wanted us to be. On the other hand, whenever we look at the word wicked, we think, what do we think when we think wicked? We think of people out somewhere just doing all kinds of bad things and just, just really doing ugly things. But wicked is, is incomplete. Just, it's just not complete. You know, the definition, one of the definitions of sin is to miss the mark. We, I've heard that all my life, to miss the mark. And we think, well, about our performance. I'm going to perform up to a certain standard and that's what's going to bring me to the mark. But that is not it either. It's to be in God's will and to miss that we think of Satan he was created a perfect being just an angel what happened he fell what did he fall from he fell from the mark that God created him to be that's why we talk about being raised up or returning to God is lifting up what God actually wants from you is not some super performance, but actually to be lifted up to be just where He wants you to be. To be restored. To be reconciled. To be right where He wants you to be. And it's just that simple. We've got this super idea of that we've got to be way beyond and God is unpleasable. 
That comes from your religion and that comes from your theology. And that comes from a disgruntled Satan that can never be what God wants him to be because God isn't even calling him to be that. And so he wants to convince you of that same idea. That's where it comes from. Satan, what his position, where, where Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. You look at him and what he's trying to tell you and what he's trying to show you and <clears throat> you're, you'll learn that your religion, when your religion looks through him and gets the ideas that are where he's at, they will not get to where they're supposed to. That's why we look to the Lord. When he came and he just walked here as a man, a creation of God, he lived his life in the flesh, just surrendered to the will of God. And that's what he wants us to be, to be complete. Satan can never be complete. He's missed the mark. He fell from it and he can't get back. Man missed the mark. He's not up to what God wants him to be. And it's not some high lofty thing that we run past trying to impress God. It's just to be to the standard, to be the human being that God made you to be. And to repent is not to try to go patch things up and make myself this and make myself that and quit doing this and quit doing that. It's to surrender our will back to God's will, to do His will, to live for Him, and to rest in that, to rest in being what God made you to be. Wicked, it's not that all that ugly stuff we see out there, well, yeah, that's the fruit of it. But to be wicked or to be is just to miss what God wants you to be. That's why the Pharisees that had everything down pat on the outside, they had everything in order and they looked religious and they appeared holy to other men. They looked like good, godly men. And it was all external. It was all on the outside just trying to patch up this appearance of righteousness, this appearance of doing what's right. But they missed the mark. They missed being complete because it was just all on the outside. They were wicked. And that's how we see Jesus dealing with them. Like they were wicked people. Not because of their performances, but because their heart was not right with God. They would do all kinds of religious things to make themselves look good to men, but inside they were full of corruption, separated from God. So that when we are restored or returned, our will is surrendered to God and we're doing His will and we're happy just to do His will. That place, that area in our lives that we won't give up, that's all He wants. And it's just as easy as letting go of something and letting it fall. But we just hold on to this one thing. We just hold on to it. We hold on to it. That's what keeps us incomplete. And when we let it go, we're right where He wants us to be. Perfect. This um, God made things how He wants them to be. And that's all He wants from us. This religion that has invented this God that cannot be pleased this God that is so angry because of your actions that cannot be pleased is what produces the idea of this love that God's just going to overlook everything. What's the use anyway? I can't do it. What's the use anyway? I'll never please Him. What's the use anyway? That, isn't that what's, where Satan's at? What's the use anyway? And so he just 
throws in there, well, here, God is love. He says God is love. So what's the use anyway? God is love. And so people just presume that God is love and He's going to take care of it and we can just do whatever we want to do because it doesn't matter anyway. That's what is produced by this God that Satan has created in our own minds and in our hearts and in our religion that He's unpleasable, that He's just sitting up there in heaven demanding absolute justice for every little thing that you say or do. And it doesn't take us long to realize that, wow, I can't measure up to that. And so we give up to that standard. And we just get so discouraged and so depressed and we just get more religious and more religious and it gets more phony and more phony and we get less real and less real. And it, we can just, our emotions are soon just, they're just completely brought to mush where they're just, they're nothing. We don't get upset anymore. We just go around everything. It's just mundane because we're just, there's no will left in that. It's just been completely destroyed. And that's exactly what Satan wants from us. He wants to get your ideas of religion so high that you'll get so discouraged and disgusted, you'll either just throw it away or you'll just turn into a bowl of mush. And your will will just be trampled and gone. That's why when we're training children, it's not to destroy their will. It's so that they can surrender their will. A destroyed will is a useless thing. It's worthless. It can't even make its own choices anymore. I've seen so many men grown up in churches and their father maybe was the, was the bishop and they just could not allow their children to make a mistake or to disgrace them. And so they just took the will out of them. And they just float through life looking perfect on the outside. But the reason they do that is because there's no will left inside. And that's, that's worthless to God. God gave us a will. That's how we were made complete. And it can be a powerful thing, a strong thing. That people can just be tortured and they won't give their will up. And all we have to do is surrender that makes us complete so it's so neat it's such a powerful thing and it's that thing surrendering our will to God to who he is brings us to the mark just brings us right there and it's not about don't do this don't do that it's about keeping our will surrendered to God's will I, so much of my life I spent trying to be saved whenever I was little, waiting for this experience to satisfy this angry God that was going to destroy me and throw me in hell in any minute if I died. And how to appease Him, how to... And so we come up with this idea that we just offer a sacrifice to appease Him, and that'll make Him happy. Isn't that what the pagans do when they offer up their sacrifices. That's not what God wants. When Jesus came, He didn't come to be a sacrifice to appease an angry God. He offered Himself to overcome our enemy, to destroy His power. And our enemy killed Him our enemy hated him because he was complete. And our enemy is not. When Jesus died, he was, had completed the will of God. And he went and destroyed Satan's power. The idea has been so much perverted that God is love. But that's what God is. God is perfect. God is complete and He is a good God. He's not up there waiting for you to mess up. He's up there waiting for you 
to return to be complete. To stay in that condition of completeness, that perfection. You see, when we die, the Bible says, hell wasn't created for the devil and the, or for man. It was created for the devil and his angels. It's not will that it's not God's will that people go to hell. That's Satan's, that's what Satan wants. He wants to bring you there. God's will is that you return to his will. And God's sadness or anger, if anything, is because we won't return to him. You know, the most regrettable thing in eternity is when people who thought God hated them all of their lives, because that's the devil's message, realize that, you mean God loved me? God wanted the best for me? God was good? And I rejected it? I didn't want it? I wanted to believe that he was angry with me all the time and he didn't want nothing to do with me. God wants us to be complete. Up above, right there where he wants us. He wants us to be raised up to that and just to walk in it. And when we refuse to walk in it because some misconception we have about him, what a dreadful day that'll be that I missed out serving a good God. Choosing to believe that He was something that He isn't. And that's what religion has done. It's destroyed the image of God. It's made Him into something that He isn't. But when we look at the life of Jesus, that is the reflection of God in this life. Look at how He lived. He just helped people. He did what He was supposed to do. He walked in the will of God. And the religious people, the fakes, the phonies, hated Him. Because He was measuring up just how He was supposed to. And they weren't. And they couldn't tolerate that. They've got to be stricter and stricter and stricter to try to measure up and they still don't measure up. Instead of just accepting something that maybe doesn't fit the mold, just accepting something. This idea of completeness is so easy. It's just be what God wants you to be. Let go of anything that He wants you to let go of and walk with Him. And walk with Him. There's a verse of a hymn. But we make His love too narrow by false limits of our own and we magnify His strictness with a zeal He will not own. It's a hymn Kevin found But we make His love too narrow by false limits of His own. And we magnify His strictness with a zeal He will not own. We see what the world does with God loves me. And we despise it. Because it's presumptuous against God. It has no effect on how we live. We've said before, yes, God is love, but God's love is not going to be on trial on the judgment day. Our love is. When we stand before God on the judgment day, what is God going to look for in our life? How well you performed, how strict you could be, how religious you could be? Or is He going to just see that you are just what He created in the beginning. You see, Satan has mankind 
in his grasp. And the only hope that we have on the judgment day, when we stand and Satan says, yeah, I've got all this, I've got his title, he's bought and paid for. I own him. And Jesus is just going to simply step in and say, I want that one. That one's mine. He has returned to what I wanted him to be. We're going to stand before Jesus. And he's either going to claim us or he's going to reject us. And to reject us is just let it slide the way it is. Or he's going to say, no, this one heard my voice. He yielded his will to mine. And he followed me. I'm going to take him. I want that one. See, we're going to be picked by Jesus is what it's going to be amount to. We're going to be picked out of the religious. We're going to be picked out of the people who don't care. We're going to be picked out of because we loved Him. We heard Him. Whenever we, we think of the word love, you know, the Bible talks about hate and love. That's some more words that are all messed up. We think love is some gushy feeling. Oh, I'm going to sing about Jesus and get teary-eyed and get all worked up into a frenzy. And that means I love Him. Jesus said, He that hath ears to hear will hear my voice. And when He talked about hate, it was about people. It wasn't this, Oh, I just want to kill that somebody. I just want to wring their neck. I just want to do this. That's not hate. Hate is when God speaks to you and you just don't even hear it. Because you're not in tune with Him. You're not listening to Him. Jesus said, If you love Me, you'll keep My commandments. If you love Me, You'll do what I want you to do. Because you're in tune with me. You're hearing me. You love me. Doesn't mean you'll always feel that way. But you'll be wanting to do the will of God. You'll be in tune with it. And to not hear it is to hate Him. To not hear it. Your children, when they will not listen to you, they may tell you, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, but they won't hear a word you say. They hate you. No matter how much they say you, they love you. If they won't listen and they have nothing to do with you, they hate you. That's how the Word is. Some of them may never say they love you. But they're trying to please you. They're trying to do whatever you want them to do. They hear when you give them instructions. And you just know they love you. It has nothing to do with the emotion. It has nothing to do with how we feel. Sometimes that comes, but sometimes that goes. But love is when you hear His voice and follow Him. And when you follow Him and you're faithful to Him, and on the judgment day, He'll say, I want that one. I want that one. I want that one. I want those. Satan says, well, I've got a claim to them. They heard my voice. They have my image on them. They listen to me. I'm going to take care of them. We see the men in the Bible that God loved. We see how many mistakes they made sometimes. And we also see how people are presumptuous about it. Well, look, they sinned. I can do whatever I want. No, that's not how it works. Hearing Him and loving Him is doing what He wanted. King David had a heart after God. He made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of dumb things. But when God spoke and it came right down to it, He heard Him. And God claimed Him. And that's what He wants for us. He just wants to be able to claim us. And all we have to do 
is follow. All we have to do is hear. All we have to do is listen. There's a lot of voices, a lot of noise in the world, a lot of ideas, but God's voice is trying to lift us up to be exactly what He created us to be. Just a man, just a woman. He didn't create us to be some super saint angel. He didn't create us to be some super holy uh, something sitting on a hill. He created us to be a man that walked with other men that had fallen. To walk and to live in a world that is not complete. That is not what God wants it to be. And just to be complete in it. To be like Jesus right in the middle of this world. That's what He wants. I think that's one of the things that's missing. It just seems like either God is love and He don't care or God hates us and we're just going to try our hardest because we're scared to death. We're failing Him. We're scared to death. We're not measuring up. But we don't know who He is. There's an actual hearing. There's an actual seeing. There's an actual walking. To a good God. With a good God. With a God that does care for us. And does love us. And He's waiting on us just to be what He wants us to be. Repentance is nothing more than surrendering my will back to God's will. I remember I had tried to be saved. I tried all kinds of things. And then I remember one day just surrendering to God's will. God, what you're asking, I, I can't do. But I will. Just recklessly abandoning with a purpose to God's will. Maybe He's got some big mountain He wants you to climb. Don't look at the mountain. Just say, I will. Maybe he's got some trial and fire that he wants you to go through. Don't look at the fire. Just say, I will. Maybe he's just got a smooth, boring path out in front of you. Don't look at that. Just say, I will. That's all he wants. Thy will. We look at all these things way out in the future or whatever. We look and we think our life is worthless. We don't amount to anything. God's got a little, you know, in a paintbrush, if you just put one stroke on a canvas, just one little stroke in it, it just looked like it messed up the whole canvas. Maybe that one little stroke is you. Just one little stroke on the canvas in the middle of the canvas you've got a perfect white thing and now there's one little stroke in the middle of it looks come just ruined it but then he starts adding other strokes same look maybe same stroke putting them here and there maybe some different colors but if you just put one stroke it just looks terrible but you start putting more in this one here that one there green here blue there yellow there all of those different colors, just one stroke, and you blend them all together, makes a beautiful picture. All he needs is that one wheel. Okay, I'll be whatever stroke you want me to be. Just let me be in the picture. And all we see is that one little ugly stroke that we are in that life. But he's painting a picture, and it's going to be complete. It's going to be perfect. And all we have to do is be willing to 
be that one little stroke. One little insignificant nothing. And just say, well, Lord, I'll be the old brown part, the old brown stroke. I'd sure like to be that pretty red stroke up there. Or that bright orange stroke over there. But I'll just be the old gray one down here. But those won't mean nothing unless it's all there. That's what complete is. That's what good is. God is good. And what He makes may look incomplete to us, but it's good. That's all He wants. And all He needs is us to be willing to be a part of that. Then we will want what He wants. We will do what He wants. And just like sin and the wickedness that we see in sin is not the wicked, that's just the results of it. That's just the fruit of it. It's just what grows from being incomplete. All the wickedness and all the hatred and all of those things in the world that are ugly that we hate, the root of it is it's incomplete. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. But when we become complete, we can be lifted up just as far as they go down. We can shine just as dark as it is in the world. As dark as it gets, it can be just as bright on the other hand. And it's all whether we're complete or whether we're incomplete. And that's all it takes. May the Lord add His blessings. See you.